Okay, good evening, Michelle. How are you? Hello, Lane. I'm happy to talk with you. Uh, tonight I'm here with Michelle Bowens. He's a leading theorist for P2P. P2P is called Peer-to-Peer -peer, uh, New Economics. Uh, he's the founder of the P2P Foundation in Chiang Mai, and I should say that he's a leading theorist, if not the leading theorist in this area. So welcome, and I'm happy to talk to you tonight. Um, I wanted to start out with a simple question. Uh, how did you, uh, when did P2P begin? When, when would you say, and then when did you get into it? Right, well, there, there's really two things. One is kind of a personal crisis I had in 96, 97, a, a burnout from, you know, my, my corporate life and a strong desire to, to change my life. So it was kind of a personal motivation. And I kind of realized that to be happy, I had to do something about, you know, what I saw as being going in the wrong direction in the world, which is basically, uh, you know, social justice and the environment as uh, as the key the key factors that are going in the wrong direction. Um, and the second thing was, uh, one of my jobs has always been like a trend watcher, and so I was noticing how these peer-to-peer -peer forms were really emerging everywhere. And I think I probably wrote my first essay already in 1999 or something. Uh, so gradually I came to the conclusion that there was kind of really a great horizontalization taking place through internet communication that had the same strong effects on society as the print revolution in the 15th century. And so I started investigating and reading. I even took a two-year sabbatical and I especially studied phase transitions. So I looked at the end of the Roman Empire and the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And you know, I started thinking how, how did those changes occur? And I, I increasingly saw peer-to-peer -peer as a leverage, uh, as a leverage to change uh, what is wrong in our society. And I, I would you know, put it very succinct, succinctly um, what is wrong is one that we think nature is infinite so we have a notion of pseudo abundance false abundance and then we think that um, cooperation and sharing should be restricted so we have artificial scarcity in the immaterial field it's um, we have copyright and patents and all kinds of impediments for human cooperation and human sharing and so the basic kind of proposal of peer-to-peer is to turn that around, is to have an economy which recognizes limitations and to have an economy where innovations can be shared uh, you know, basically with the world community. Um, and then my work is kind of being in an observatory of all the things that are happening in that field. You have a background with uh, what you teach at the Vatican. Um, so you mentioned the Roman Empire. Talk a little bit about the history that underlies a lot of the economics that we have today, moving up into, say, capitalism in the uh, later, uh, the, the next millennium after the... Right, right. Well, there, there's uh, different things to say. Um, I mean, there, there's really amazing, you know, kind of co um, analogies between the period we're living and the period uh, at the end of the Roman Empire. So basically, you know, the Roman Empire was a globalized empire. I mean, of course, within the sphere of Europe, but that was you know, what the world looked like. And there's always a point when an empire grows that the cost of expanding becomes bigger than the benefits of expansion because they have all this overhead and they have to maintain the empire and repress unruly peoples. But once they reach that point, then slaves become too expensive, then they can't get enough gold anymore because it, you know, in, in this type of system, it comes really from conquest, right? And if you look at what changed at the end of the Roman Empire, is they moved from global organization to a relocalized system of production, organized around the local domains. But very importantly, they kept a global culture. You know, through the Christian Church, the Catholic Church they kept a unified uh, European culture where innovations uh, would stream from one side of Europe to the other because the monks were traveling, the monks were studying, the monks were working and they were sharing their innovations. Um, 
and it's pretty much what we're living now you know today we have a crisis of extensive globalization we are reaching the limits of what we're doing with nature and we have to change how we ex you know use nature in a way that it can replenish and regenerate itself which it can do right now uh, but at the same time we have this technology the internet which allows us to keep global cooperation alive so my proposal which is based on actually what is happening today is that we combine global and shared innovation commons so where if you invent something you share it with the world right through uh, a commons of knowledge code or design then you relocalize production because you also reinvent a new type of distributed machinery so what happens with computers for you know the intellect is now happening with machines that make things we have 3d printing we have cnc milling uh, we have multi machines we have uh, and so combining relocalized production with a shared innovation commons and global distributed enterprise so the companies who make things can actually work together on a global scale even though they use local production sure. and you scale up from you know, when you move from a an age of resource abundance and energy abundance to an age of energy scarcity and resource scarcity you have to move from economies of scale where you become competitive by doing more of a thing so you actually you need more resources to be competitive you, ex you exploit nature more in order to be competitive to a situation of economies of scope where you can mutualize your resources and that's what we're doing we are mutualizing knowledge through open source production and we are mutualizing physical infrastructures through, for example, collaborative consumption. Simply by moving from each of us having an individual car to having a car sharing club, we can do the same amount of traveling with only 80%, with only 20% of the material uh, resources that you need to do the same thing, right? So mutualizing resources has an enormous benefit. And if you look at distributed manufacturing what's interesting there is that uh, instead of economies of scale you have scaling up from one right you have printing on demand you have production on demand so you have a micro factory and you make an open source car like the wiki speed or local motors cars and somebody orders a car you make it and it's designed to be modular and to be biodegradable material and it follows the cradle to cradle production philosophy so that everything in your production can be reutilized there's no waste but you also you only make it when it's you know when there is demand for it because in our consumption system we have overproduction continuously and so we need marketing and advertising to sell you know the things that we make but we can't really sell them because people don't really want them right so this whole system is insane. It has to recreate new desires all the time. And well, even more than that, it, you know, it creates planned obsolescence. It designs products that are willfully uh, broken, basically, you know, so that your, your light bulb uh, only has 1,000 hours of, of life, and then you need a new one, and you need five years to replace the TV. This is engineered scientifically to break down after five years and this is absurd in an age of resource and, and energy scarcity we need to step away from that in a modular system you know you it's you can have massive parallel distributed development of any of any part of your your product like a car you can have a global community constantly improving your car and you can change the wheel, you can change the steering wheel, you can change the body of the car um, simply by going to one of these micro factories. So that's, that's kind of the basic idea of how we move into another mode of production, another system of creating value. Yeah, what you're talking about what? here is the wiki speed car and a lot of people certainly don't know about this. Uh, let, let's talk about this because many people might think well P2P can build maybe a motherboard for a computer or maybe a small piece of software or hardware uh, but what you're saying is they're actually building cars and that's pretty astounding 
Yes, you know, but e even uh, the motherboard Arduino, you know, I remember discussions five years ago where, the, you know, people would tell me the one thing that won't be possible is to make computers that way, you know. Um, and well, they, yes, they can, and they do. And uh, the Arduino ecology is already a thriving ecology of, you know, two, three dozen businesses that two years ago already made more than 100 million a year in turnover. And I, I haven't really, you know, checked the latest figures. And yes, you can make a car. It's the thing is you design the car differently. And the beauty of Wikispeed is that they applied the methodologies of open source software development to open design. So it's called, and I'm not an expert in this, but this is called Agile Programming, Extreme Programming, Scrum. And what it allows you to do is, is very fast design. So this is incredible. They designed this car, which has a five-star crash rating. So it's like industrial standard safety in three months, you know, using a team of 70 volunteers in, in six different countries. Um, you know, it takes Detroit, according to experts, five years to change something in the car. You know, from the time somebody engineers it, until the time it actually is implemented in the car, it's, it's five years. And to conceive a car from scratch, it would take 20 years. They don't do it, you know, and the Wikispeed car has been conceived from scratch and designed into a workable driving car that can be produced in a micro factory in three months. So it's a sports car, now they're going to the next step, so they're crowdfunding to do the next step, which is a commuter car, that we also have 100 miles per gallon, so five times more energy efficient, um, but it's still using gas, but you know, you can imagine open source cars using hydrogen, using uh, electricity, um, I mean, by the way, I, I went to Chengdu and the Yang um, in my last trip, and I was absolutely astounded to find these big Chinese cities with four million people where every single motorcycle is electrical. So, I mean, there's so much we can achieve if there's political will. Um, and that's the big problem, right, is that all these initiatives are bottom up and don't really get funding and support. So they're happening, but they're happening slowly and they have still a hard time scaling globally because they, you know, they have to operate on their own. A lot of this is uh, very practical, which is really interesting because uh, I introduced you as a theorist. And the theory, of course, came first, um, you know, this is possible to do. And I think that the theorists were really astounded that, say, the car could be designed and produced in three months. And last time I checked, you said that it was about $25,000, but it'll come down in price to 17000 Within time. Yes, that's the commuter car, I think. The I commuter mean, car is planned to set at 17,000. Not bad. Uh, not bad. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, it's competitive. It's really competitive, but it's, the, you know, the thing is it's a completely different model, right? It's not a model where a, a huge car company is competing with other huge car companies. It's basically every mechanic becomes a car producer. That's right. That's, that's the idea, right? You have a garage, you can make a car.